Hello and welcome to this Sunday service at Salem. Coming from outside today, so if it starts raining, that might be a problem, but hopefully it won't. A very warm welcome. Let's pray together. Father God, we thank you for the technology which enables us to be connected in our worship of you, even though we may be scattered in person. And we pray that as we look at your word now, that you will speak to us through it. Challenge us where we're comfortable and comfort us where we are challenged. We ask this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. So last week we started looking at the Sermon on the Mount as um, we come to the end of our series on discipleship in 2021. And we looked last week at the Beatitudes and we said that in them, in those nine attributes of the character of a disciple, Jesus paints a picture of the ideal disciple. And this week we're going on to the next part of the Sermon on the Mount. And so I'm going to be looking at Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 to 16. Matthew chapter 5 verses 13 to 16. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt has lost its taste, how can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything, but it's thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A city built on a hill can't be hidden. No one after lighting a lamp puts it under the bushel basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. May God bless us now as we read his word. Today we've got a slightly ambivalent attitude towards salt, don't we? Salt is lovely on chips, but also it causes health problems. But in the old days, life without salt would have been completely impossible. Salt was used to give taste to food, of course, as we do today, but also for so many other purposes. Before the fridge and the freezer, salt was used to preserve food, uh, to keep it during the winter. So you'd pick your crops in uh, summer and the beginning of autumn, and then you would preserve them in salt. And you would uh, perhaps if you killed some animals, you would also salt their flesh and preserve them over the winter. Salt was used to disinfect wounds before the days of antibiotics. Newborn babies were rubbed with salt after they were born. And there's actually a reference to this in the book of Ezekiel, uh, chapter 16, verse 4. It says, on the day you were born, your cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to make you clean, nor were you rubbed with salt or wrapped in cloths. The English word salary comes from the Latin word for salt, salarius, because uh, Roman soldiers would receive an allowance in order to buy salt, a salt allowance. It was that important. Um, and so salt was actually used as a sort of money in itself, something very valuable to trade. In fact, whole wars were fought over salt. And uh, the word salad comes from the word salt as well, because the Romans used to put salt on their green vegetables and their salad leaves uh, when they ate them. Salt also has a very important spiritual significance. In the Old Testament, salt was an essential part of the sacrifices in the temple. In Leviticus 2 verse 13, it says, every offering of your grain offering you shall season with salt. You shall not allow the salt of the covenant of your God to be lacking from your grain offerings. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. So in other words, it was impossible to make these sort of offerings in the temple if you didn't possess salt. When people wanted to make an agreement between them to show that they were going to be friends and not enemies, they would often eat salt together. It was a sign of the covenant of their friendship. And when one country conquered another country, they would sometimes spread salt over the fields of the country they conquered in order to make sure that that civilization would not flourish again. 
If we look at the history of Europe and America, we see that salt has been really important here as well. One of the reasons behind the French Revolution was something called Gabelle. This was a, a tax on salt. And during the revolution in America, the British army tried to stop the rebels um, by restricting their access to salt. In India, 1930, Mahatma Gandhi walked to the sea very famously, a 200 mile walk in order to um, collect free salt from the sea. And it was an act of protest against British taxes on salt, which were affecting poor people. And just very simply, if you've ever made bread at home, you will know that if you forget to put the salt in, it just tastes completely horrible. <laughs> so salt is very important and historically has been tremendously important. So when Jesus says to the disciples, you are the salt of the earth, he's saying that the life of the disciples of Jesus is completely essential to the life of the world. We talked last week about the nine Beatitudes, the nine uh, aspects that the life of disciples should, should show. And this week, we see that such lives, lives which show those nine virtues, these lives are completely essential to the world in the same way that salt is. Without people who are poor of spirit, without people who are meek and pure hearted, without people who mourn, without people who thirst for righteousness, without peacemakers, without merciful people, without people who are faithful, even when they are under persecution, the world would fall apart. Everything would go wrong, like a world without salt. And here's an interesting fact for you. How can you recognize Judas, the disciple who is going to betray Jesus in the famous picture of the Last Supper by Leonardo da Vinci? If you look carefully at that picture, you will see that in front of Judas, there is a salt cellar on the table, but it's overturned. Judas is the one who has lost the salt. He's overturned the salt. When you stop being a disciple, a faithful disciple of Jesus, when you stop showing in your lives those nine virtues we talked about last week, you're like salt that's lost its taste. You're no good anymore. So Jesus uses the same metaphor to show how, sorry, Jesus uses one metaphor to show how uh, essential the life of the disciple is to the life of the world. And that metaphor is the metaphor of salt. And then he goes on to use a second metaphor. And this metaphor is the one of light. Now, unlike salt, I don't need to say so much about the importance of light because we all know this. The importance of light hasn't changed since the days of Jesus. In our family recently, we were having a conversation about what would happen if the sun disappeared overnight. We concluded that in a very short while, all the plants and the crops of the earth would die and a terrible famine would spread over the world. The temperature would fall, of course, very rapidly, would plummet and the planet would freeze. And then, of course, there'd be other complex consequences due to the effect of gravity and change in planetary orbits and so on. But in a sentence, everyone and everything would die very soon if the sun were to disappear. And even on a less dramatic level, it's impossible for us to live life without light, isn't it? And there's so many medical studies which show that low levels of light have a really bad effect on our mental health. That's why it's so important to get outside, especially in the winter. And that's why there's such a thing as SAD, seasonal affective disorder, I think, um, and so on. So once again, Jesus gives the same message. You disciples, you who are poor in spirit, you who are meek and tender hearted and mourn, you who hunger and thirst for righteousness, you who are pure hearted, you who are peacemakers and merciful, you who are faithful to Jesus, the world needs you. The world needs you like it needs light. The world cannot flourish without salt and light. And in the same way, the world cannot flourish without people who show the qualities of the disciples of Jesus. 
And so it follows that it's absolutely essential for you and me to keep going, to persevere as disciples of Jesus and not to give up because it matters not just to us and to our future, but it matters to the world. And this is where we need to be careful. Jesus says, you are the light of the world. It's impossible to hide a city that's built on a hill and nobody lights a lamp to put it under a bucket. No, you put the lamp on the table so that everybody can see it in the house. And this is how you should let your light shine so that people will glorify your father in the heaven in heaven as they see the good things that you do. Now, as we listen to these words, maybe it's easy to believe that Jesus is saying that it's someone who does good things in order for people to praise God who's a good disciple. It sounds a bit like that, doesn't it, at the end? He says, you should do good things so that people can see them and glorify your father in heaven. So is that what a disciple is? Is it someone who does good things? Well, disciples do good things, but it is also possible to do good things without being a true disciple of Jesus. Because following Jesus is not a matter <clears throat> of doing external things. Following Jesus is a matter of your heart. It's a matter of where your heart is. As disciples of Jesus, we do good things because we love God with all our heart and soul and mind and strength. And that, that order is important. The love comes first and then the good things follow. And let's look at our second reading, which illustrates this very well. This reading comes from the book of Revelation. This is the last book in the Bible. And in this book, at the beginning of this book, Jesus writes seven letters to seven churches, congratulating them for what they're doing well, as we saw in the Beatitudes last week, but also pointing out where they need to improve. And I want to read to you the letter that Jesus writes to the church in Ephesus, which is in, in modern day Turkey, I believe. And this is in Revelation chapter 2. So I will just turn to that in my Bible. Revelation chapter 2, starting at verse 1. To the angel of the church in Ephesus, write. This is Jesus speaking. These are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks among the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your toil, and your patient endurance. I know that you cannot tolerate evildoers. You have tested those who claim to be apostles but are not, and have found them to be false. I also know that you are enduring patiently and bearing up for the sake of my name, and that you have not grown weary. But I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember then from what you have fallen. Repent and do the works you did at first. If not, I'll come to you and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. Well, we can see from that that the church in Ephesus was doing lots of good things. Jesus congratulates them for working hard, for persevering, for not growing weary, for not giving up. It seems that as well as doing good things, they've even been persecuted for Jesus's name. And so certainly they are showing some of the attitudes which Jesus congratulates in the Beatitudes. But, says Jesus, I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. It's possible to do lots of good things. It's possible even to suffer persecution for Jesus' name. But if we do all this without love, it's worth nothing. And the Apostle Paul is very clear about this in his letter to the Corinthians. He says, If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but I don't have love, I'm only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, if I have a faith that can move mountains but don't have love, I'm nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but I don't have love, I gain nothing. 
So if we really want to be salt and light, if we want to be the sort of disciples who are essential to the life of our communities, we need to relight that first love, that passion that we had for Jesus when we first became Christians. When we look at new Christians, and I have the privilege of being a minister, of working with people who are being prepared for baptism from time to time, people who have recently put their faith in Jesus. And what a privilege that is, because you see people who are on fire for Jesus. They're like someone who has just fallen in love. And yes, they are, because they have just fallen in love with Jesus. They're full of enthusiasm for their faith. Nothing is too difficult for them to do for Jesus. If Jesus asks them to do something, they're desperate to do it. They are ready to give up their whole lives for them, for Jesus. But then, you know, the years go on. They carry on doing good things. They carry on trying to be faithful. They carry on going to church. They read their Bible. They try to be good. They pray. But that love, that passion, that first spark that was there has gone to some degree. So if that's true of you and me, what should we do? Well, what would we do in any other relationship? Think of a marriage. If in a marriage you're finding that, you know, things aren't as great as they used to be. Maybe the relationship between you and your spouse has cooled a little bit. What's the first thing to do? Well, the first thing to do, I think anybody would recommend, is for you to spend some time together. And exactly the same is true of the relationship between us and God. If we feel that we, like the church in Ephesus, have lost that first love, then the first thing we need to do is to spend more time with God. To go to chapel regularly, to read our Bible, to spend time with friends who share our own faith, to join a life group and especially to spend time in prayer alone with God as often as we can manage it. Because being a Christian, being a true disciple of Jesus is not a matter of following rules and regulations. It is not even a matter of working hard to be a good person or to do good things. Being a Christian means being in a living relationship of love with Jesus and with God, a relationship of love between us and Jesus. And everything that we do, the poverty of spirit, the meekness, the tenderness, the peacefulness, the pure heartedness and so on, all of these flow naturally when we love Jesus, when our relationship with him is good. And so our readings today remind us that being a disciple, being a true disciple of Jesus is essential. It's not just essential for us because when we die, we go to heaven. That's only a small part of the story. It's essential because the world is designed to flourish when people show those qualities of being a disciple of Jesus. And without the disciples of Jesus, the world is going to be in a pretty dire place. We are as important as salt and light when we live out the true life of a disciple of Jesus. And remember what Jesus says, when salt has lost its flavor, what good is it? It's no good. It's only fit to be thrown out and be trampled. And so it's really important for us to maintain that first love, that first passion as disciples of Jesus, to come back to that first love and to ask Jesus to relight that flame of love more and more every day. So I've got some questions for you here. I've said that as salt and light, the disciples of Jesus are essential to the life of the world. I wonder whether it would be an interesting exercise to try and make a list of everything that the church and Christians have contributed to society in the past. Now, don't get me wrong, I know the church has done some terrible things, for instance, the Crusades and many more terrible things over time. But 
the church has also done some incredibly good things and it's very very important not to lose sight of them and not to become cynical about the church and about Christians and when we start listing the good things that the church and Christians have done over the years we will see that they far outweigh the bad so try it out as an exercise try whether on your own or in your group to list all the good things you can think of that the church and Christians have done in the past and today and then think about that statement that of Jesus is that we are like salt and light when we are true disciples of Jesus essential for the healthy functioning of the world so that's the positive and then the second question I suppose is the other side is do you know of examples either today or historical examples of Christians who have lost that first love and could that be a danger for us in Salem and if so, how do you think we could protect ourselves against that danger? And the last question is a personal one. What's the temperature of your love for Jesus? On fire? Gone out? Or kind of lukewarm? That's just something for you to reflect and pray about. May the peace of the Lord Christ go with you wherever he may send you. May he guide you through the wilderness protect you through the storm and may he bring you home rejoicing at the wonders he has shown you may he bring you home rejoicing once again to our doors